There's no doubt that Rose Wilder Lane made significant changes in her retelling of her mother's autobiography, Pioneer Girl, and that Lane interpreted these stories through a different thematic lens, colored by Lane's own political and social views of the past as they related to her Depression-era present. For one thing, Lane uses more abstract language. Wilder's style in Pioneer Girl, Little House in the Big Woods, and eventually the complete Little House series itself is built on simple, concrete vocabulary. This approach, of course, appealed to young readers, but also gave her narrative voice dignity, grace, and even power. Here's a rough draft passage from Pioneer Girl that depicts the awe and beauty Wilder remembered from her first sunset on the vast prairies in Dakota Territory. The sun sank lower and lower until looking like a ball of pulsing liquid light. It sank gloriously in clouds of crimson and silver. Cold purple shadows rose in the east, crept slowly around the horizon, then gathered above in depth on depth of darkness from which the stars swung low and bright. The language is simple yet lyrical, vivid and concrete. As readers, we're in the moment with Wilder, not standing on the outside of the scene being told what to think, but sharing this moment of beauty and grandeur directly with Wilder herself. Here's a passage from Let the Hurricane Roar that speaks to the vastness of the prairie landscape. But notice the abstract language and the sense that we're outside the scene, observing Caroline and her feelings. We don't directly share the moment with her. In that instant, she knew the infinite smallness, weakness of life in the lifeless universe. She felt the vast, insensate forces against which life itself is a rebellion. Infinitely small and weak was the spark of warmth in a living heart, yet valiantly the tiny heart continued to beat. Tired, weak, burned by its own fears and sorrows, Still, it persisted indomitably, it continued to exist. And in its bare existence itself, without assurance of victory, even without hope, in its indomitable existence among vast, incalculable, lifeless forces, it was invincible. Lane simply doesn't trust her readers here. She slams home her theme and philosophical view here through Caroline and uses abstract vocabulary that further distances the reader from Caroline's feelings and the unfolding action of the novel. Again, let's jump ahead to The Long Winter and see how Wilder handles a similar scene of helplessness against the vast prairie landscape. But even after Laura was warm, she lay awake listening to the wind's wild tune and thinking of each little house in town alone in the whirling snow, with not even a light from the next house shining through. And the little town was alone on the wide prairie. Town and prairie were lost in the wild storm, which was neither earth nor sky, nothing but fierce winds and a white blankness. For the storm was white. In the night, long after the sun had gone and the last daylight could not possibly be there, the blizzard was whirling white. A lamp could shine out through the blackest darkness, and a shout could be heard a long way, but no light and no cry could reach through a storm that had wild voices and an unnatural light of its own. The blankets were warm, and Lara was no longer cold, but she shivered. Wilder's depiction has more power and depth, and creatively, structurally, it hinges on Wilder's direct, simple, and vivid language and her objectivity. She trusts her readers will understand what to feel, as Lane did not. Lane's characterizations in the dialogue she gives her characters in Let the Hurricane Roar also reflects a major stylistic difference between the two authors. Lane gives her characters more colorful dialogue. I don't think this is necessarily based on differences in audience. Remember, Pioneer Girl was originally written for adult audiences, too. Take a look at this example 
from Let the Hurricane Roar when Charles or David in Young Pioneers shouts, I'll save it or die trying. I'm not licked yet, not by a damn sight. My God, don't you turn against me. He dashed the pail to the ground and left her as though he hated her. Lane's characters and their dialogue seem more contemporary than Wilder's, but they also seem more immature, i.e. the Charles David character dashing that pail on the ground and stomping away in anger. Or consider this example when the Charles David character says, I'm not a baby. Losing a little sleep won't hurt me, he said. One quick note. The sharp and often abrupt conflict between Charles and Caroline or David and Molly in Lane's book makes Let the Hurricane Roar an adult novel. Lane's depiction of married pioneers is radically different than her mother's. Lane also changed what may appear to be insignificant details in Let the Hurricane Roar and let these changes underscore the book's political and social themes. In Lane's book, the archetypal railroad town is 10 miles from Charles and Caroline's dugout. In Pioneer Girl, of course, the railroad town, DeSmit, is within walking distance of the Ingalls family homestead. Even when Wilder fictionalized her experiences in the Little House series, Laura and Carrie can walk to DeSmit from their homestead. Why the difference in Let the Hurricane Roar? Because that 10-mile difference makes Charles and Caroline's homestead all the more remote. It enhances her character's isolation and makes their efforts to survive all the more heroic. This isolation is deliberate and is linked to Lane's themes of independence, personal courage, and the raw endurance of an individual family unit. Lane also makes one very poignant and I think personal change in the lives of her characters, and that's the birth of their son. They named him Charles John. He was a fat, healthy baby and almost never cried. Lane, her mother, and Caroline Ingalls all lost infant sons. The Caroline Molly character in Let the Hurricane Roar has a happier future. At the end of the novel, she dreams of the day her son will inherit a happy, settled future. But please note that Caroline Molly has no help from anyone but her husband when their son is born, a scene that once again reinforces the isolation, courage, and integrity of the family during times of crisis. Even as their son is born, Charles and Caroline, or David and Molly, go it alone. I want to talk about one other significant change that Lane made to her mother's Pioneer Girl material, and that has to do with the Caroline Molly character herself. She may begin the book as a quiet person filled with wonder at marrying such a man as Charles. Over the course of the novel, however, the Caroline Molly character resents the frontier and rages against it as Ma and Laura never do in Pioneer Girl or the Little House series. But the angry sense of injustice welled up again. She hated the dugout, hole in the ground, as Charles had said. She hated the broken stove, the heat, the stripped, ugly prairie. She hated the wind that rasped her nerves and covered everything with dust. Her whole life seemed poor and mean. Fiercely, bitterly, she pitied her defrauded baby. She pitied Charles, robbed, hurt, and forced to work for other men. Her loneliness rebelled against the cruelty that took him from her. They did not deserve this suffering. They had trusted and been betrayed. Her cry was, it isn't right, it isn't fair. By the end of the novel, the Caroline Molly character is strong, independent, and valiant, able to survive even an archetypal blizzard on her own. And this, too, is a major theme of Let the Hurricane Roar, because ultimately the book belongs to the Caroline Molly character. Midway through the book, Caroline and Mr. Svensson are talking about this country, the West. Mr. Svensson complains about the frontier, this damn country that feeds nobody. 
Caroline was silent. In politeness, she could not say, it's men that make the country, what's the matter with you? And yet, in Lane's novel, it's not the men who make this rough, tumble world survive for humanity. It's the women. Or in this case, it's one woman, the Caroline Molly character. In creating Charles and Caroline, their infant son, and their world in the West, Lane was also directly influenced by her mother's transformation of Pioneer Girl's autobiographical material into the fiction of Little House in the Big Woods. Remember that Lane began writing Courage, the working title for Let the Hurricane Roar, just days after her mother received that three-book offer from Kanawha. Lane saw firsthand what had worked especially well in her mother's transformation, the creation of archetypal characters in an archetypal time and place. As we've already seen in part one of this class, the Ingalls family in Little House in the Big Woods are an archetypal pioneer family. Wilder structured the story around a mythic year in their lives and in a setting that is both historical and yet somehow timeless. Lane used the same approach and let the hurricane roar, with a few modifications. The book is structured in four sections, which moves through large chunks of time, except section three, which takes place during just one day in Caroline Molly's life. And yet, even that takes on a mythic, dreamlike quality. Afterward, Caroline remembered the day at the town site as though it had happened to someone else. Even at the time, everything had an air of unreality. The town site has no name. It's simply somewhere in the American West, a symbol of the hundreds of railroad towns that sprang up on the prairie and represented the hopes, dreams, hardships, and failures of an entire generation of pioneers. This is important, too. And let the hurricane roar, Charles and Caroline don't have a surname. They are simply Charles and Caroline. Remember that quote from the review in the Saturday Evening Post? Charles and Caroline might be any pair of thousands upon thousands of hardy young pioneers. A note about the characters' new names. When the TV series aired, the main characters were David and Molly Beaton. David Beaton is the main character in Lane's later novel, Free Land. He marries a young woman named Mary, but is drawn to a young pioneer girl named Nettie Peters. David Beaton and Nettie Peters of Free Land are loosely based on Lane's parents, Laura and Almanzark. So, I know where the name David came from for young pioneers, but I'm not sure why screenwriters chose the name Molly. To my knowledge, it's not a name either Lane or Wilder used for important characters in their fiction. Just one last observation about the mythic parallels between Let the Hurricane Roar and Little House in the Big Woods. Both have a timeless quality about them, which reinforces that sense of timelessness in different ways. Wilder's Little House in the Big Woods ends with a focus on the timeless present. Laura looked at Pa sitting on the bench by the hearth, the firelight gleaming on his brown hair and beard and glistening on the honey brown fiddle. She looked at Ma gently rocking and knitting. She thought to herself, this is now. She was glad that the cozy house and Pa and Ma and the firelight and the music were now. They could not be forgotten, she thought, because now is now. It can never be a long time ago. Let the Hurricane Roar, however, focuses on the future, that mythic, unknowable time that never is now. Somehow, without quite thinking it, she felt that a light from the future was shining in the baby's face. That big white house was waiting for him, and the acres of wheat fields the fast driving teams and swift buggies. If he remembered at all this life in the dugout, he would think of it as a brief prelude to more spacious times. And yet, 
what no one could have known in 1933 when Let the Hurricane Roar was published in book form was that Wilder's now would outstrip Lane's future, that Wilder's literary legacy would eclipse Lane's.